Welcome everyone to the next instalment of the uh, Leading Thinker series. And uh, it's with my great pleasure today that I'm here with uh, Ewan McIntosh, who is the CEO of Notosh, which is a very innovative um, um, organisation based in Scotland mm -hmm. that's done an enormous amount of work getting organisations to think about their creativity and harnessing their innovation and uh, workforce capability in general. So, so welcome, Ewan. Thank you for uh, meeting up in downtown Sydney as well. It's nice to be able to do this face to face rather than on Skype. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> no, it's a pleasure and uh, thank you very much for for uh, spending a valuable time with us so I guess uh, the first question that we've asked others uh, in the series is what are you pondering at the moment what, what what's what's something that's um, important to you at the moment in terms of where you're at I think both myself and um, Tom Barrett who I work with would say that um, it's difficult to find time to ponder mm. at the moment we're doing a lot in terms of helping educators think about very, the very basic um, reason for teaching, uh, the basic re the basic reasons behind learning, uh, that along the way, somehow along the way, particularly in the school sector, um, but quite obviously in further in higher education, um, we talk, we hear lots of teachers talking or complaining about oh, assessments, this examinations, mm. that, about the constraints of curriculum, about uh, oh we've got to cover X Y Z, we've got to do this that the other. And we are trying to help teachers see that actually the main job that they have to undertake is thinking about pedagogy and that the pondering is the work. It's not all the other stuff. Um, mm. Thinking about how you teach, why you're teaching something in a particular way. And I guess the core kind of thesis behind it all that we are working on at the moment is design thinking. It's a kind of merger between um, a lot of educational theories that your listeners are more than familiar with, inquiry-based learning for one, problem solving, um, a strong emphasis on, on students solving real genuine problems, not fake imaginary pseudo problems okay. invented in textbooks or Very by context teachers. Context-based. Very context-based, but also the context being defined by the student, not mm. by a, a, a lecturer or a teacher deciding months in advance or on a Sunday night what it is they're going to do the next day. Well, that's very relevant to a lot of our um, teachers, of course, because we're a vocational uh, education and training uh, provider, and a lot of our teaching is workplace-based. Mm. So. I think the, the challenge is not necessarily the location of the learning. I think the, there was a kind of cry in the in the noughties through the 2000s that um, all this new Web 2.0 technology would be the death of school and we're for school, and that school seen as a place of learning. Uh, mobile technology means people increasingly talk about the learning that can take place outside school, um, almost without thinking hard about what goes on in school. We hear about the flipped classroom where lectures are published online or on iTunes as a podcast and that uh, what we're not really hearing enough about is okay well, what happens in the remainder of that time uh, in school in the institution and there's an assumption that it's just more of the same of whatever happened in there before but I don't think that we ever gave enough thought in the first place to what happens after the lecture um, and so I guess that's what we are passionate about and it's passionate about making that learning as um, based in real context as possible, putting the responsibility of what is going to be learnt, how it's going to be learnt, uh, maybe where and when it's going to be learnt into the hands of the learner, not the trainer, lecturer or teacher. Mm. So that's quite a mind shift for education institutions. Absolutely. Um, I guess, I mean, there's been a lot of talk in recent times about the role of content and uh, historically there's been a lot of emphasis placed on content. Uh, certainly I know a lot of our teachers when they think about e-learning, the first thing they think about is content. Mm. Uh, and of course technology. And I guess one of the things we try to emphasise with our teachers is while those things are important, as you said, the most important thing is quality teaching and learning practice. Yeah. Uh, the, the internet is awash with content. We, we can't compete on content. But we're, we're sat at the moment in one of the most successful architecture firms in Australia, at BVN, and um, we're surrounded by books, we're surrounded by content here. And down that corridor are people who may occasionally come in and get a bit of inspiration from what I would call enrichment material. Um, but you can't look at uh, a Le Corbusier historical book and understand that content 
uh, 100% and then go and build a building that's suitable for people today. Mm. You'd use it as a as a backing, as, as one line of inquiry. I think that most teaching and learning has got the balance wrong. We do well, actually, to see how architects go about their business, mm. which is about understanding a core set of um, skills and content and constantly evolving that. Um, talking with colleagues and meeting them, um, sharing ideas. But at the end of the day, you've got to have more than just content uh, to be able to survive and thrive in a 21st century workspace, or for that matter, in a 21st century pastime and hobby or passion. Mm. Do you think learners have changed? Do you think, um, do you think the needs of young learners are different today? I mean, we, we hear a lot about Gen C, um, do you I don't know? think that really carries that much weight anymore. If you look at most young learners, given the first time that they're... Well, let me cite an example. Uh, in Brisbane, we're working with primary schools, elementary schools, and there you've got um, people who, you know, they're trying their best with this kind of approach where it's more student-led, and the kids are saying, give us a, you know, tell us the answer, give us a problem mm-hmm. here to solve. They don't like having, having the initiative to take. They don't want to take the initiative. They want to be told. They want to be spoon-fed. Why? Because they're used to it. Yeah. Um, so what we are trying to propose to them is, you know, that there's no such thing as Gen C. There's no such thing as Gen Y. <laughs> most of the technologies we've used, the technology that most of your listeners are listening to this on or viewing it on, is no more than five, six years old. Mm. The only excuse oldies have is they chose not to learn anything about it Mm. so the best time to get into blogging was maybe five six years ago the second best time is now Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, so there's no excuse for not learning or for um, for not wanting to evolve we can all be gen c learners if we want to be it's just unfortunately for us most um, older educators choose not to so you're not a big subscriber of the sort of um uh, that that schism that uh, mark prinsky was famous for there. Even he regrets that now. Um, I saw him this summer and once more poked him in the ribs about it and he says quite publicly in his seminars, you know, there's no such thing as digital native now. It worked 10 years ago. It was useful 10 years ago when I came up with it. It was probably useful for another five years. But basically, basically since 2005, 2006, since all these social networks have become much more commonplace, um, I think he's right to be retracting it and saying, let's stop using that terminology now. Well, if you look at the uh, demographics in Facebook, it covers quite a lot of... Uh, the largest group in Facebook is over 35. Right. And your fastest growing is over 75, which mm-hmm. is um, Jen, goodness knows what, what, the grandparents trying to communicate on a level with their grandchildren and their own children. So, yeah, that, I don't buy that argument anymore. I think it's a very convenient excuse for laggards to remain laggards. Mm. Um, and frankly, education doesn't need them we need new attitudes towards learning and instead of a trainer seeing themselves as a trainer or a teacher seeing themselves as a teacher these two groups need to start seeing themselves first and foremost as learners and if they're incapable of learning something new and importantly telling people about what they're learning and sharing that learning then I think it's very hard to put the label professional onto um, that kind of individual. Mm. Think about every other professional, doctors, architects, um, lawyers. Every one of these professions um, is a profession because its members share new discoveries as they make them. And I think the same is true of education if we want teaching to be a real profession. Here, here. Uh, I guess the you've obviously got a focus on capability development and I read your the recent paper that you had published with Pearson Pearson mm-hmm. Learning about um, I think tweeting uh, tweeting for teachers that's it yeah yeah there you talk a lot about capability development for for teachers about using contemporary social networking social media uh, as a as a professional de- development tool yeah. for teachers now, this is a digital literacy in many ways. It, it's, yeah. it's one that we certainly have spent, uh, made quite an investment in trying to get teachers to um, uh, to, to, to gain. Um, what, what was the crux of that, that paper that, that really, if you put it in a nutshell around there, and what were we trying to achieve with that? I think my... I think my favourite crux, because there are a few there, but the favourite crux is absolutely uh, from Neil Hopkin um, that my colleague Tom has been working with now for um, nearly six months. We have a long-term relationship with the school. Neil is the executive head. And it was a line that he um, came out with 
around giving around the role of a leader, the role of a um, someone with the the title leader, head, principal, whatever you call it, validating the use of social media. It was a point that. Um, when we did the initial run of interviews and um, Tom had been on the phone calling up and saying, you know, asking a bunch of questions much like this. And the first thing Tom tweeted back to me was validity and validation of social networking as a professional development activity. And if you look at Tom, if you look at me, the only reason that we're able to learn as much as we're able to learn is because we have online communities of practice that we are part of that number in the tens of thousands and so there's a very good chance that when we reach out and ask a question when we reach out and ask people what do you think of this idea that we're mulling over that we'll get some kind of response and far from an echo chamber of people who kind of go oh yeah that's great it's oh. it's an echo it's not an echo chamber it's a chamber full of different opinions many of which may disagree others which will challenge others which will provide resources to help us justify what we're doing mm-hmm. um so yeah it's absolutely core but to be core to every teacher's professional development it needs to for some folk be validated by the head teacher or it needs to be validated by uh, documentation around you know the, the, the annual review yep. um, why not ditch the annual review and instead prove yourself through your ability to engage long term every day in online communities of practice Yes it reminds me of something uh, Nigel Payne said when I went to a workshop with him uh, recently he said that it's he mentioned the issue about leadership mm-hmm. and about the importance of leaders actually using um social uh, learning approaches to developing uh, uh, work for developing workforce capability in the organization so mm-hmm. if they if they write in a blog if they do a podcast if they're doing it if they're engaging with external networks yeah. uh, then as you say it there's nothing new in this I mean in 2005 in East Lothian in Scotland we were developing a blogging platform and right enough we started with about 20 people and it stayed 20 people for a year nothing much happened which in most managerial books would have it down as a failure ready to be killed but again the leader the director of education uh, pushed it um, Don Ledingham got those 20 people around the table and asked them you know who are your friends can you bring two along to the party can they bring two along to the party and now six years on that web community that online teacher sharing with teacher student sharing with student community is serving between three and a half four and a half million pages a month Mm -hmm. and there's only 15,000 kids in the district I guess one of the challenges and you alluded to it early in the in our conversation was time Mm -hmm. and as you said teachers are very time starved they had an enormous amount of um, what they consider to be non-core forces bearing on them, compliance, um, and we have our own whole range of compliance and bureaucratic things that a teacher needs to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for many teachers, they just feel that having to blog or, or, yeah. or somehow deal with this f- fire hose of content that's out there is just so overwhelming. And uh, You ask these guys if they're short of time. In an architect's office, there'll be no one that says, oh yeah, I've got all the time in the world. Go down into the street and talk to the guy running a burger shop. Uh, he also has no time. Mm. Uh, nobody has enough time to do everything they want to do. We all have to prioritise. Teaching slightly different because in teaching, your life is ruled by a bell for a large chunk of the available time you have and you have to make the best of that that you can Um, what does that involve it involves personal discipline self-discipline in terms of really using effectively what little time you have Um, it makes me think of being in a taxi uh, a week ago in the city of Taipei Taiwan we had 25 minutes in a taxi to go to the airport and Tom gets his moleskin out and he's immediately reflecting, looking back on what he's been noting down for the past mm-hmm. week, grabbing that time, that precious time, when he's awake, vaguely alert and um, wanting to recap on what he's done. A lot of people, a lot of teachers see that as a kind of chore that must be done uh, on a Sunday night or you know, yeah. th- you know, before, they, before they're able to plan a lesson or what have you. And actually it's maybe the the unplannable actions it's the habits that you can get into that are the most powerful setting aside an hour long departmental meeting every week is the most inefficient use of time you'd be far better to catch up on that content as and when you can Mm -hmm. and instead um, you know use your quality time when you've got it and if you only have five minutes 
know exactly what kind of activity is worth doing in five minutes. Mm. Go and read one blog post. Um, go in, uh, sp- in five minutes, just check the last 50 tweets that have come. Don't worry about the other 50,000 that have yes. passed since the last time you've been on. It's just there, yeah, just at the river at that moment. Exactly. And I think if you're, <laughs> if you think, if anyone thinks that they can somehow see everything going on and, and cope with that, that flood of content, then they've, they've misunderstood. Uh, they've misunderstood really what this is about. It's about personalising it for you. It's mm. about finding out what you can and then creating something new from it. If all you're doing is sucking down and not reinventing any, anything on top of it, then you're not really contributing back to the community yes. with fresh ideas either. Yes, it's a two-way conversation. Yeah. Um, so I guess that, that brings us to one of the other questions we'd asked some of the other um, speakers, and that was, what do you think the greatest hindrance to the uh, take-up of contemporary technologies is in the education sector? What, do you, that's what are some of the barriers and challenges that are there? You obviously mentioned some of them. We uh, did a workshop in Brisbane yesterday, and we filled a wall with barriers. <laughs> um, it, we, we asked uh, the, the educators there to take a, a post-it per problem, and put them up in, uh, underneath certain titles or above certain titles and we created a kind of cityscape of problems, the building blocks as we call them. It's very apt given we're in an architect mm-hmm. studio. Um, these building blocks are, well most of them are very predictable. Energy, most people don't think about when they're freshest to do certain things. So anything that is free and freely available, if you, as long as you have a somewhere you have a line in or you have a mobile phone with web access um, understanding when you have the right kind of energy personally and when your students have the right kind of energy to harness maybe a river of information that's coming in and knowing when it's best just to place it down and read a book or do some closed eyes and just reflecting on what you had that day. So energy was uh, incredibly um, highly rated. Time keeps coming back. But most of the time it's not time that's the issue. Um, It's something else. It's about um, having access to the equipment at the right time. So I'm free, but I don't have the resource I need at that time. It's free when I'm not free any longer. We're back to that tyranny of the timetable. So one of the things that we've been working with um, teachers on in London, in Australia, elsewhere, is the idea of handing over control of that timetable and its formation to students. A lot of it actually is based on Norwegian models that we see very frequently where students might have five hours of one particular subject, mathematics, for one time a week. So Monday morning is from eight till lunchtime is the only time they do mathematics and that's it for the rest of the week. Mm. And in that time, you have high energy. Well, actually you have peaks and troughs and you can take advantage of both of those, but you have depth and you have the ability to really get to know something well. And therefore, when you go to a school where it's all 40 minutes here, 40 minutes there, 40 minutes there, you find that the amount of catch up that has to go on is just huge. You know, Um, stupid amounts of catch up, 20 minutes even out of an hour long lesson to catch up on something that could just have been better learnt first time round. So looking at um, energy and time but looking at it with your students could be an incredibly interesting exercise. Even just colour coding a timetable in terms of high energy, low energy, and mm. want to be outside energy, you know? Yeah, yeah and perhaps um, you know, connecting students that are got that energy at the right time rather than putting everyone in the one, the one class and saying, you've all got to be high now. Exactly. And as a French teacher, I used to st- stand up in front of the classes at after lunch they're all shattered because they've mm. been outside running around and of course traditional French lessons all about pace and teach new vocabulary flashcard crazy and your kids are shattered and they're <laughs> kind of like stand up oh, and they stand up you know and you need to choose the time but it, I don't think that decision's the teachers I think that decision's a negotiated one mm. um, it's funny that it's time and energy it's never access to kit access to kit generally nowadays especially in adult learning is not a problem mm. thanks to these it's time and energy yes yeah, so certainly a lot of our our teachers uh, have mobile phones or smartphones particularly uh, or we're seeing an increasing number of tablets as well mm. and they are coming 
to us and looking to us to provide um, capability development about how yeah. to effectively use them. They know they've got all these great capabilities, but they're not entirely sure. As we walked through Sydney Airport today, there's a worker with one of his you know, yellow fluo vests on, on a coffee break. And what was he doing? He was on his iPad looking mm. at the news. So, yep. you know, that struck us as it used to be, you know, from the Nokia to a smartphone, and now it's from the smartphone to a tablet, mm. um, that he must be putting in his utility pants that he's wearing down at the airstrip. Well, there's so uh, much touted about them in the post PC era, and uh, I think I think there's a lot of you know this, we, we're seeing those trends. I think. Yeah. Um, which raises uh, brings us to I guess the issue of the theme for uh, this series is um, flexibility, about what is flexibility and designing for flexibility in mm -hmm. terms of designing your course delivery to be flexible. What what does that mean for you? Do you think? It means to me that if I'm doing a vocational course, let's just say it's architecture, because it sits it yeah. here, and I'm looking at a bookshelf just over your shoulder and seeing that um, one of the challenges may be to make habitable a village where a bridge has been swept away. So you've got a couple of options. One is you see books on bridges, um, you see books on superstructures. There's one up there about brick. Um, there's a copy of The Third Teacher, a book about... Um, learning spaces and uh, what's that got to do with bridges you might say well the fact is if you're grazing on material if you're immersing yourself in more content than you need to in order to understand the world better then you're going to find a more ingenious solution to the problem that you've had um, so knowing what's in the third teacher relatively well you'll find uh, the importance of or where bridges work within learning institutions and where they don't work and you understand that bridges are great for making learning transparent they're great for showing off a city um, they're great for getting that vista as you arrive so if it's been swept away maybe you're actually taking something from a school's architecture book you're mixing it with brick maybe we'll do this out of brick instead of mm. the usual steel structures and we'll do something a bit kind of old-fashioned the original bridge was old so we'll try and reflect that and then you go to superstructures and you realize well hold on we could do a hydraulic bridge that's now going to um, cope with earthquakes and shifts in land or large flooding that can um, actually it has a bit of biomimicry in it uh, biomimicry is not something that architects are um, meant to know about but some architects have gone and immersed themselves in the world of biomechanics in order to make buildings and structures that um, act like uh, natural objects mm. um, now if they hadn't done that if they just followed it by the book we'd have very samey buildings outside we would have um, nothing new we wouldn't be able to really take advantage of these kinds of technologies because the furniture we use the electricity sockets that are embedded in the ground wouldn't be there yep. so it's a lovely metaphor really for how learning can be flexible learning can be flexible when you give to students a relatively broad area that normally you as an educator would go off and explore and you allow the student to drill down and find the problem they want to solve and the way they're going to solve it. So the student-centred learning? Well, it's more than just student-centred learning. Student-centred learning traditionally has still been the educator foraging through all that massive material down to a problem that they then present to the student on mm. Monday morning. What I'm saying is that's still, for the student, a problem that doesn't matter because they didn't come up with it. Right. What I'm saying is that the student will care if they've come up with the problem. And not only that, they'll have covered a lot more curriculum than any traditional problem-solving curriculum would ever demand because they've had to go off and explore so many other things. And they may not be Im immediately useful. They may not get a very deep knowledge of them, but they're aware of it. And that awareness factor, when we do have so much content we could get to grips with, is really a core media literacy skill. You can always go deep anytime. Yep. Um, but understanding where the, the, the deep line of thinking comes within the broad nature of that area of work is really important. The, the design thinking firm ID will call it T-thinking, they want, and they want employees who think like T-thinkers. A T-thinker, first of all, has that broad brush of a lot of different areas. So, you know, biomimicry, the use of certain materials, the importance of furniture, interior and exterior, but they also have a very deep knowledge 
So really understanding the school's architecture, which is why we're here. Really understanding a particular fine line that's, um, uh, um, that is a specialism, if you like. But also being aware about what happens in hospitals in case there's a useful lesson to rub off in the school's area, for example. Mm, so having a broad, broad scope of knowledge, but depth where it's required. Exactly. Yeah. It's the antithesis, perhaps, of what the PhD is meant to do, which mm. is get really deep into one very minute area mm. um, at the expense of breadth. But in this world, breadth and understanding how to cope with breadth is such a vital skill. Mm. Well, I guess we're in no better time than to be able to have access to such a breadth of knowledge. I mean, you know, in our palm of our hand, we have the virtually the... It's all there. It's all there. <laughs> yeah, so. so go out and find it. Mm. <laughs> That's right. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank you, Ewan, for spending your time with us and giving some insights about, um, uh, about learning and teaching. Um, just a reminder that uh, you can f go and check out uh, Ewan's... Um, organization Notosh yep. and we'll put the link there on the on the blog post uh, and also of course Ewan has a fabulous blog which you can uh, which you can uh, check out too and of course he's on all across all of the social networking spaces Twitter and Facebook as well absolutely thank you very much thank you a pleasure